you ever need a strong fan, get the Vernado. Just saying. These things will pull it down. It's good. How's everybody doing? Awesome. Good. Good. Um, I would encourage you, if you weren't here last week, we actually are, our live stream is up on Facebook, and then we're posting it to our website. So, and then it's on YouTube under Open Door House of Prayer. So if you want to catch last week's sermon, I briefly want to give you the the uh, 30 second version of it. I talked about the adventure of staying steady last week. Many of you were here. Um, and just the importance. Of, there are a million things we can preach on and do and talk about and topics and studies and all of that. But at the foundation, I talked about four key points of waiting on the Lord, hearing his voice, staying locked in in the word, really reading it daily, and then truly responding it with a place of faith. Of causing you do those. I mean, there's there's probably 20 different ways to say the four points I just said, and you people write books all on, all on it and all sorts of things. But uh, the Lord has really been triggering me to sit and wait upon Him and actually wait. It's the it's the weakest thing a human being can do is to truly sit there and do nothing, especially men. And because we're going like we're gonna, wait, I got to do this. I got to figure this out. Like, I'm gonna I'm gonna fix the problem. You know, some of you women are that way too, but I am a fixer. If something's wrong, I'm on the phone, I'm, and I'm like, I'm going to make it right, I'll apologize, I'll go there, I'll do whatever. If something goes wrong and I drop the ball, I'm go- I want it right so that I can rest. But how many of you know that there are things out of your control that you can't make right overnight, right? And the more secure we get in the Word by sitting and actually understanding our, our, our heavenly identity before the throne... We will really realize how, how we, like, we really won't care as much about what people think. We won't care, not that we don't care if we did something wrong, but we won't care if someone wants to have an opinion about us that isn't necessarily congruent with truth. It's just people are going to think what they're going to think, right? And so um, I want to pray for us and then dive right in. We're going to go to 2 Timothy. <clears throat> so if you want to turn there, I'm going to pray for us. Father, we pray for your word to run swiftly in this place this morning, to be glorified in us as we dive into your holy word, what you're saying and what you're doing. And I just pray that for the fire of the Holy Spirit to rest on my tongue this morning, that I represent you rightly and that you would encourage us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So we're going to go to 2 Timothy. If you're not there, you can turn there. And I have a, some things I want to share that I believe are really important for us this morning. I've been sitting, I, I almost preached a sermon straight up on faith. I wanted to preach a sermon straight up on fear because I love talking about both those topics and how they go hand in hand. And you all, you'll often hear, I don't know who said it, but. Uh, fear is the neighbor of faith, or faith is the neighbor of fear. I mean, they're side by side. There's a property line. You can easily step into one or the other. How many of you know you can't really walk in both because you end up being a double-minded man, as it says in James 1, when you're in your unstable in all your ways? And that's why it says to ask for wisdom, expecting to hear, so that you won't be double-minded. You won't forget what you look like when you stare at yourself in the mirror. You won't be double-minded. And so what I really felt this morning, though, was Paul's... Uh, admonishing Timothy and just calling him higher and calling him into a place of, of not just, hey, when you think Timothy, don't just think little immature, uh, you know, 12, 14 year old Timothy. I don't know how old Timothy was. Some of you scholars might shout it out. I don't know. But I know that Paul was towards the end of his life and something happened in Paul. And I love to, to try to relive the moment of what was happening when he wrote this. Uh, this is obviously his second letter to Timothy. And he's laying out some things to Timothy uh, in regards to the wisdom that Paul has beheld his whole life. And being, we know Paul's story, he was once known as Saul, killing Christians uh, around the clock and organizing and mobilizing people to kill Christians and, and to create persecution. And then we know the story, Jesus appears to him, and it's all history. It's full of the Holy Spirit, his eyes, he's blind for three days, he's open, and then bam, he basically writes most of the New Testament. That's a pretty cool story, right? But what one of the things that I, or there's a few points that I want to lay out this morning that I often think 
when we read, sometimes we just blow through. Maybe that's not you, but I often will just read something. I'll look for the meat in it, and I'll go. And the Lord just invited me into 2 Timothy. So we're going to take some chunks and break down 2 Timothy today, if that's cool, because I really believe it's quite relevant to the day that we're living in, whether you're 15 years old or or 55 or older or whatever. It doesn't matter. The bottom line is we're living in a day and an hour where we've never needed to be more locked in than now. We've never needed to know which direction to go more than now. And every day that we live is one day closer to the coming of the Lord. And I don't want to be asleep when he does come. Amen. We don't want to be asleep and say, ah, that's just politics. And these guys are crazy. And I'm going to, oh, blah, blah, blah. And I don't want to be, we just need to, we need to zip our lips. We really do. We need to stare at heaven. That'll give us answers. The, the TV really won't ever give you an answer. Yeah, you can stay up with what's happening, but I love some of the things that Paul is telling Timothy to do and to stay locked in. And this first thing I'm going to read, I want you to turn. <clears throat> he is telling us to stir up, point number one, stir up the gift of God. I love this. So let's go to verse 6, 2 Timothy 1, verse 6. Therefore, I remind you. To stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Let's stop right there for a moment. Paul imparted something upon Timothy. You know, we sometimes think, you know, laying on hands. What do we do? Do we not do it? Do we do it. Is that culturally relevant now? Does your church do it? Does mine? Throw all that out the window. Paul laid hands. I'm sure he grabbed him as a man to man, put his hand on his chest and spoke destiny into Timothy. Made it really simple. This is who you're called and created to be. This is in your line. This is who you are. And I could see Timothy saying, oh, my goodness, right? How many of you in here are a product of someone telling you who you are in the Lord? And it awakened something, right? Some, someone called forth something, and it, it drew the fog out. A fresh wind came in, and suddenly you begin to see rightly, and the gold which was always been in you begin to get revealed to you. And you're saying, oh, wow, you've called me. But I love this because every time we go to the meat verse of a chapter or a book, there's always a, a preset up that we skip. And I don't want to skip this because the next verse says, For God has not given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Well, I often think, you know, you might text a friend and say, pray for me. I've been struggling with anxiety and fear over this situation or that. It might be monstrous and you're literally shut down and depressed, or it could be subtle. I believe most believers struggle with a subtle fear and anxiety, the worry of, is there, is there going to be enough? Or what about that situation coming up? Or I've got to get the taxes in on time, and I've got, the, there's your friendly reminder, I've got to do this, that, and the other to get this done. And it causes a literal, you might be the most secure person in the room, but I assure you some form of anxiety tries to attack you and I every day. And how we channel this fear and anxiety will determine whether we're willing to walk out the calling that Paul is telling Timothy. My man, I could just see him saying, check this out. I remind you, stir up that gift of God. Do, do not be afraid. He, he announces it right off the bat. Stir it up. I laid hands on you and called it forth. And your spirit, I could just see him saying, he's telling him this because he wants Timothy to know this is going to cost you something, bud. It's going to cost you something that you were never intended to carry, which is your flesh. But you're going to have to make a conscious decision to literally stir yourself up and not come under fear and remind yourself. Remember, young man, God didn't give you a spirit of fear. I could just see him like a coach talking to a guy. You know, I, who was it? Man, I want to tell the story. Uh, oh, it was uh, it was March Madness. Coach K said to Zion Williams. He said, to, everyone knows Zion is, is the number one draft pick in the NBA. If you don't know him, he's six foot seven, I think 275. He's just a beast. It dunks like I've never seen before. And he looked at him when they were down by three. And he looked at him in the, right before, 10 seconds left. And he said, son, you were made for moments like this. Go do it. Or don't have to look the quote up, but you were made for greatness. This is what you were made to do. And could you imagine hearing that as an athlete in life and saying, you know, am I the best? Here we go. What does he do? He drives, makes an off-balance, gets crushed in the paint, makes an off-balance play, scores, gets the bucket, goes to the foul line. He ends up missing the foul shot, Duke rebounds, and they win. Regardless, the storyline, though, is someone who is the greatest of all time, basketball coaches, arguably, of college, 
tells the best currently, you're made for this. And what does he do? He goes out and he executes. And I truly believe Timothy is come under the authority of Paul and saying, I'm going to shake the dust off you, son. It's game on. And you were made for this. So don't come under those little fearful lies that you're just a little young guy. You're a nobody. You're never going to be anybody because everybody in this room feels it. Some form of those fiery darts. We think he comes like the red horned devil that's just going to say, here I am. Be scared. No, he comes as an angel of light, disguising beautiful to deceive us, then to get us hook, line and sinker. And then we're stuck because all the fear and we we listen to all the lies and then we're anxious. And he's saying, hey, resist that. Remember, stir it up. <clears throat> just a few examples. Though, I just felt the Lord wanted to highlight I, you don't have to turn there, but I'm just going to briefly touch on them. Genesis 3. Is, I love Genesis. You could, we could teach out of Genesis 52 Sundays out of the year. It's just in the first four chapters, really. First three chapters. Because there's so much meat for what God had intended to what man did and then how God said he's going to redeem. It is a real prophetic picture of what is to come. But here's the thing. Is that when the snake came, again, he didn't come as the viper <laughs> Like hissing at them, he came to try to allure and pull away what God had called good. That's right. And as a result, we see what happens. Adam and Eve, and, and did God say, when, when, do you really can't eat from that tree? Here's why he said it. And how many of you know that he talks in half truths, right? So it'll feel like it's a little bit true. And that's called the barb of the hook. You know, you know, you can spit a lie out. Sometimes when you swallow and you're like, I'll just try it, it's no big deal. And we see in one moment, why did Eve take the apple? Fear of missing out, right? Total fear of missing out. Adam, take one, buddy. Here you go. Let's do this. That looks pretty good. It, it was pleasing to the eye, too. It wasn't just like, ah, that's the tree over there. God said, don't do it. Get out of here, little snake. No, her spirit was enticed. Her spirit was awakened to what potentially could be. And suddenly the truth got twisted and they went out of fear. I truly believe they ate from the tree out of fear. Not because they were afraid of the devil. Not because of, they were even afraid of God in that moment. Obviously they had no fear of God in that moment. But fear of what if there's something better and I didn't get it. That would be disappointing. And they chose, we know what they chose. They chose to edify feelings rather than to resist in that moment. In feelings, one, we look at Peter in that moment connected to Jesus for three years. Like, the guy's crazy, walking on water. I'll do it, Lord. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, cutting people's ears off and just everything gung-ho for Jesus. And think about the steadiness of literally Jesus. Let's go back 2,000 years ago, and we're in Fort Pierce. And this, let's just say Jesus came to Fort Pierce and, you know, me and a bunch of young other guys, we decide we're going to be on part of his leadership team because he calls us. He probably would have picked me because I wasn't very good in school. He picked the uneducated, the ones that cussed a lot. And I could, I always say they probably had a big dip in their mouth back then and cussed a lot, love to go fish and not be educated and just do whatever they want to do. And those are the guys he picked. I look at it and that he didn't pick the great ones that were good in people's eyes, the ones that everybody loved. He picked the ones no one wanted. He sought them out. He brought them in. And then you look at, he, he was with them for three years. I mean, literally, probably night and day. He commissioned them. They came back. They're fired up. The story's around the campfire. Can you picture them out on the beach in, you know, Fort Pierce? And they're just, uh, imagine we're those, you know, handful of us guys. We're those people. And, and put your ladies, you put yourself in those shoes. But imagine being that close to him. Not just one encounter where he heals you and touches you and you're healed. But I'm talking, you get up and like, where'd Jesus go? Oh, he's like a mile that way with the father, right? gets up so early and you're like why does he do that imagine all of the conversations the probably thousands of feelings you saw and suddenly out of fear peter cashes it all in in one moment we see him say ah you know what i don't know the guy there goes the rooster i don't know the guy there it goes again you know three times and then peter's devastated we see a guy that in that moment Obviously, we know the story of Peter. He gets redeemed. Jesus reinstates him. But the bottom line is he had his emotions wrapped up in a calling that was good for him. And the moment adversity hit, Peter cast his chips in and said, I'm out. And literally, 
and, and thank God for the mercy and the grace that we see in Jesus that he actually goes and pursues him and wins him back. And we see what Peter does. He ends up a martyr for the church. It's amazing for Jesus. But what's the point? Why do I bring the story of Peter up? Because fragile guy, but yet strong on one end because he was with him night and day. I can't imagine living with him over and over and over and then saying in one moment, I don't know that guy. Can you imagine that? Right? Could you imagine if I denied any of you in here? And I don't, I, in, for three years, I've never lived with any of you outside my family, and I denied you. Um, I mean, the mindset that Peter had, and I want to propose, again, he did it out of fear. Self preservation in that moment was greater than obedience for Peter, yeah. which is why Paul said it so clearly. I remind you to stir up the gift of God. How many of you know Jesus laid hands on Peter? The Son of God alone laid hands on Peter. And Peter said, I still don't know this guy. I'm out. And he chose to bow to a system and to to man in that moment rather than Jesus himself. We look at Judas. We don't really need to go into that story. He was in it for himself from day one. And we look at fear. He was driven by money. Fear was his, his, money was his idol, was his God. And he tried to, you can't manipulate God, by the way. He's unmanipulatable, if that's a word. He, he, he cannot be manipulated, but yet Jesus kept him on his leadership team until the end. Chew on that for next time you get annoyed with someone you work with. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give him the boot. Well, remember, Jesus took the, the guy and kept him on his team and never fired him when he was stealing money from him. And then actually set him up to die. That's what I call humility and believing in people. But again, Judas was fear driven. You look at Ananias and Sapphira who withheld money. In the book of Acts, I think it's Acts 5, and they, they fall dead in the presence of God because they lied and stole, from, and they lied to the Holy Spirit. You look at what is keeping human beings separated is fear. It's a fear-based reality, and Paul is telling Timothy, punch that demon in the face and overcome because he's given you a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. And the sound mind aspect is something we cash in when it doesn't feel right. Soundness of mind comes when we resist the devil and we stay locked in. <clears throat> if you go, go to 2 Timothy, uh, go to, let's stay there, but go to verse 8. <clears throat> but we know that the law is good if, uh, if it uses lawfully, knowing that the law is not made for righteous uh, for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for the sinners, for the unholy and the profane, for the murderers, uh, uh, the murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, for fornicators, uh, sodomites and kidnappers, for liars, uh, so on. So I'm gonna I'm gonna skip down actually. I wrote the you know what I wrote the wrong verse down. I actually meant to go to. Um, hang on, one second. I don't wanna. You know what? This is what happened. I went to First Timothy by accident. The wind blew it back behind me. My Bible went forward back to First Timothy. I was like, that's not the verse I read. I don't remember reading this. There we go. Now I'll go to verse. Uh, told you the tornado is powerful back there. Go to verse 8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead. According to my gospel, for which I suffer as an evildoer in point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure <clears throat> all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain salvation, which is in Jesus Christ with eternal glory. That is faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. And if we deny him, he He also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful and cannot deny himself. Now I look at, in if I'm going to skip back and just read of uh, the very beginning of verse, uh, this is in chapter 2. He says, now therefore my son be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And that the things that you have heard from among many witnesses, commit these faithful men who will be able to teach others. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. 
And if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. And, and, and so I, I jump back just a little bit because I want to make a point here is that the lineup that Paul is enlisting Timothy and is saying, listen, son, it's time to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And grace, we talk so much about Romans 6. If you want to learn more about grace, check out Romans 6. It's one of my favorite chapters. The grace of God, it's a free gift. How many of you know that a gift is something that you don't earn? You don't earn Christmas presents. You don't earn a birthday present. And if you do, you probably have like a crooked. <laughs> that's pretty crooked, right? A gift is a gift. It means you didn't earn it. That would be called a, a salary or a reward. It's different. A gift is something that someone gives you to bless you. And I want to propose, not propose, but just declare, the grace of God has empowered us to overcome. That's why Paul talks about it. Paul makes it very clear. Hey, Timothy, my son, be strong. He didn't just say be strong in the Lord. He said be strong that, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. There is a grace and a free gift to overcome adversity, to overcome persecution, sin, to stay steady in the midst of it, to overcome accusation, to overcome and to actually finish the race that, that Paul talks about. And so I skip down because he makes it very clear to endure. He said, for which in verse 9 of chapter 2, which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect. He is essentially saying, I have a yes in the Lord that will not be shaken. And I will go to the point of death because of my strength. No, it's not what he said. Because of the, the grace of God that is in Christ Jesus. And I often think it's very easy to miss the grace of God. So it was, oh, grace, grace to you, brother. Struggling with sin, all oh, the grace of God will cover it. Just stay in there, buddy. That's called sloppy grace. Romans 6, Paul addresses it. Hey, so if grace abounds. Can we just keep sitting then and doing what we want and saying what we want and doing it, running around and just living like hell and grace of God will cover it? No, Paul says, absolutely not. He says, embrace the grace of God that will cause you to overcome sin. And the reason he teaches on it and talks on it, even why I'm sharing it this morning, is because there is an empowerment in the grace of God in Christ Jesus that will cause us to shift and to shake and to move into the very beings he's created us to be. If we just see it as, oh, poor me, I'm just a sinner, just, just need the grace of God, that's a poor man's mentality. He didn't die on a cross so we could manage our sin and keep struggling. I mean, it's, it's very common. I'd say the majority of the church lives that way. It's just a struggle I have. It's anger, man. It's just pornography. It's what I struggle with. It's just this. It's just that. It's my, you name it, I steal. I have a problem. My, my daddy stole. And my, we, whatever it might be, we have a list that for some reason we have not, our eye, our spiritual eyes have not opened to the grace of God. Oh, I struggle with rejection. I've read the scriptures about being received, but I still feel rejected. I understand. I struggled with rejection for so, so many years. You say, oh, man, not you, Chris. You're a guy in a microphone, and you seem confident. It doesn't matter what you look like, what you do. I don't give a rip. Some of the most successful people in the world are some of the most insecure people on the planet. And they hide behind accomplishments, money, and efforts, and works. Until we get grounded rooted, established deeply by embracing the gift of God that empowers us called grace. Paul is announcing this to Timothy. This is going to endure you. Just like an athlete, he talks about it. You've got to fight the good fight, bud. You're, you're an athlete right now. And if you're going to compete, you're going to obey the rules. And how many of you know that the rules are a good thing? And it says that we're no longer a slave to sin in Romans 6, but we're now, we use our, the grace of God empowers us to be slaves to righteousness, to use our bodies as instruments of righteousness. And until we get the grace of God component, what ends up happening is we just do religious Christianity. Read my Bible, pray every day. It's going to go good. God, I just hope one day. I don't think he put humanity on the earth to be Christian specifically. People that get saved and are saved by who he is 
I don't think he did that so that we could just kind of go through life and hoping for the breakthrough, waiting for the prophet to come into town. Stop. I'm not waiting for a prophet to come into town. All I know is this thing delivers my soul if I allow the gift called the grace of God and I actually open it. Some of you are like, that sucker's still sitting at the bottom of my bed. I don't deserve it. I'm such a sinner. Well, that's because a demonic lie called fear and anxiety and rejection is owning you. And I lived in it for years, so I'm going to be blunt. I lived in that rejection for years and didn't believe I was loved because I didn't feel loved. Are you hearing me? Not listening to our feelings, but locking in. So he makes it really clear. He says, he, he calls out and, and, he, and he lays out to Timothy, hey, stir up that gift of God. Don't be afraid. And then he, said, he tells him, <clears throat> I'm just going to briefly mention it and skip it back to verse 8. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of the gospel that, that has been put in you. And he, and he lays out, Paul talks about being a prisoner. And this is who he is. And then goes forth and says, this is a time like never before for you to not be ashamed, but to lay hold of the grace of God in you because you're going to have persecution. You're going to have literal everyone in here is having some form of a trial right now. Guarantee it if you're honest with yourself. <clears throat> so being strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's point number three. Uh, just, to, just to kind of reiterate that because what I did in my notes, you can forgive me. I skip, and as you see that I jump back. I don't like doing it that way, but number one was stir up the gift of God. Number two was not to be ashamed, <clears throat> as I just m mentioned in verse eight. And number three, be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We just talked about the grace aspect. And let's go to number four, staying uh, locked in and resisting fear. So let's go to number four, uh, verse 20, chapter two, verse 20, Second Timothy. But in the great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lusts. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call out on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient. In humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so they, they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been captive by him to do his will. All right. So <clears throat> make it very clear. You jump back. He says in verse 21, cleanse yourself from the latter. He will be used as a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So as we get, when we get saved, we're justified by the blood of Jesus. The sanctification process, which is the ongoing every day that I just read of process. This comes by our yes to the Lord. He just doesn't come and say, all right, Chris, time to get up. I'm going to make you holy and you do nothing. It's a partnership. Just like he walked on the earth. I talked about it last week. Jesus made it a point. I'm going to spend time with the Father that I would remain holy. Because he's, he made himself subject to humanity. He became a human and relied fully on the Holy Spirit. So should we. And so, so check this out. He says, if we're going to be prepared for every good work, he is, Paul is giving Timothy a reality that you, if you stay locked in, you will be able to flee from use, youthful lusts. I'm not just talking about, oh, this girl has a crush on the youthful lusts. I'm talking about, think about youth for one moment. As a youth, if you're older and you're, go back to your child. If you're a child, think about this. In your youth, you, there's, there's a few things you have. You have time. You, you're typically more free than you're ever going to be, depending on most youth are. You have energy. That's, this is why 
glad that he's not just talking to Timothy because he's a young man, but he's, it's a declaration for the body. You have energy, which means when, you, when you're a little bit older, there's certain things you're just like, I don't care to do that. I'm good. Like, I'm too tired to even go out right now. Like, there just comes a point where like, I can give a rip, right? But it's, sin is still, there's temptation never going to end, right? So we're with him. So check this out. As a youth, there is an extra energy and a power. What he's talking about is that sense of fascination. As a youth, you hardly know anything. No offense, young kids. When I was a kid, I hardly knew a thing. Like, we, you think you have the world figured out, and you're like, the older you get, you're like, I don't have this thing figured out. How do I do this? And you see your need, neediness. But as a youth, there's something in you that is also curious because you can't help what you don't know. And there's something that you want to know. But guess what? That actually never leaves you as an adult. We're adults. You, you want to know. Like something, whether it's whatever it might be. And he, he lays it out. Just because the hook, line, and sinker are coming at you, flee from the youthful lust. Well, I feel like I need this. Flee from the youthful lust. Well, I, you know, it's just something that, ah. When you catch yourself doing that, ah, ah, you're, you're caught, Right? Let the Lord catch you. It's great to be caught by him because he's not catching you with a whip at your back. He's catching you with, son, this is going to destroy you. I know it's just a little piece of candy, son, but you don't understand. On the other side is a major disease called sin, and it's going to, it's going to tip the ship, so don't do it. Right? And he says this, pursue righteousness. If you flee from something, that means you're going in a different direction. If there's a pursuit that we could go on right now, as we, and I want you to think practically, not just Paul and Timothy. Put yourself in these shoes right now. Put yourself at home with your family. Your job. Think about regionally. I always talk Treasure Coast because what I believe the Lord wants to do is not just in this little room and on this four and a quarter acre property. Though it's significant, but I truly believe because if we see our place, rightfully so, in our homes, we'll be able to go out healthy. So if we flee from youthful lust, that means we're going to do a 180 because you can't, if you're going fleeing, that means you're going directly away. Not like, hey, it's over here. I'm going to kind of, no, no, you're fleeing. You means you're getting the heck out of there. There's no playing around, which means you're going to go to safety. What is he saying? Safety is pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. How many of you know that's a conscious decision? It's very difficult to often do a 180 when you feel like going in that direction. But I, I assure you, I've never regretted choosing not to sin. Like, ah, should have sinned, man. That would have been worth it. That time with God was way better. Or way not as good as that sin would have been. That's demonic if that would be in my head, right? <laughs> and I want us to get this because he is, he is warning humanity. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Get a little wisdom, this is what happens. You walk with the Lord a little bit, get a little wisdom, you think you know something. Especially, I remember being a young adult, and just being like, man, I got that figured out, I got that topic down, I'll preach on that, and then you realize, wait, I only have like two sermons. I don't know anything. But what ends up happening is when we get a little bit of wisdom, we think, if we're not connected, we think, it's good because it's a longing that the Lord has put in our heart to actually be a voice to people that don't have voices, to be a voice to help people get out of the miry clay. But if it, if it gets twisted and it gets about us and we don't allow the Lord to sanctify us, the grace of God to empower us, what ends up happening is we now use our spiritual gift to argue about meaningless things. Are you, are you following me? Oh, this or that, this, this, that, and the other. For instance... The news. That's right. I said it from the pulpit. The news. And we want to debate things that don't really have that much measure. I'm not against the news, so don't, don't leave here and say, Chris came at, I'm not coming at anybody. I'll come at me. I turn the news on and I just am like, what? Spend a lot of time with Jesus. This is homework. Then turn the news on. And then listen, don't be like, Sean Hannity's on, he's going to bring it. Or the other guy from CNN's on, he's going to bring it. Ignore the name and just ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying and doing? Because what will happen is we have a need for fascination on the inside. We know that. So it's he made us that way. It's one of the human longings to be fascinated. 
what will happen is this. If we're not resisting, we won't avoid foolish and ignorant disputes knowing that they generate strife. We'll do it so that we can be right and we'll end up damaging our own spirit, man, let alone anyone else around us. I'm not saying that you can't look at a current event and what's happening. But what I am saying is when it becomes an important thing to you and it's, it's your message, we're in trouble. And I've done it before. I've gotten excited about stuff and it just doesn't really go anywhere. And I'm like, wow, I don't really know the Lord right now. I know more about what's happening and I don't even know if I can trust what's happening. And then you begin to get twisted. Guess why I'm saying this? I just happened. I didn't even plan on talking about this this morning. But he talks about it. And why is it important? Because this is the easiest America is ever going to have it right now. And guess what's going to happen? When the fire gets turned up and laws get changed and your faith is on the line when you preach. And suddenly they're locking people up left and right. You could get caught up in your religious rights rather than being a son of the king or a daughter of the king and declaring the word of the Lord. You could get caught up in all the disputes and you could end up having doctrine that's not biblical. Are you following me? I want to make sure everyone gets this because this is coming to America. I don't like to say that. My flesh doesn't, but my spirit, man, isn't. isn't. I feel empowered to say what's coming to America isn't just everything's going to be peachy. They will hate you for my name's sake, is what he says. Not America. Yes, America. They will hate us when it's all said and done. And in my generation, might be your, what if it's your kids? What if it's your grandchildren? I want us, and I truly believe, Paul was laying out the line of Timothy to say, there's a day coming when you declare the word of the Lord, and he'll lock you up and want you dead. What happened to the disciples? Do you think they just died a ripe old age on an island with a little bottle of water on the side? Isn't God good? No. Heads, you know how Paul died? Head, totally taken off. You know how a lot, do the research, it's crazy. These guys laid their life down. He said to Peter, when he reinstated Peter, hey, I'm going to re- I'm. I'm, I'm calling you to, you know, go shepherd my church. But by the way, they're going to, when you were young, you can go wherever you wanted. But when you're older, they're going to take you to where you don't want to go. And we know the story. He gets, he's martyred. So I don't want to spend too much time on this, but we got to grab a hold of this, this understanding that if we just kind of, eh, I just shouldn't do that lustful thing. No, Paul is saying, get the three point stance and sprint as far as you weigh, as far away as possible from sin and go right to righteousness. And as you do that, you won't get caught up in all the rhetoric that's going on around the earth, and even the church right now, and this and that and the other. And every time there's a post on Facebook, everybody is like, I'm going to, I disagree with that theology, and we want to attack it. And it's like, who cares, right? I'm not being rude, I'm just being honest. Who cares? Because if I don't know this man, and that's what Paul and Timothy are laying out, if we don't know this man, and we succumb by our feelings and our emotions. What ends up happening is we fall right into a system. All right, go to 2 Timothy 3. <clears throat> How are we doing? Do you follow me? I know this is kind of, we're jumping around here, but I'm, I'm going to land it here in a moment. So far, stir up that gift of God. Don't be ashamed of the gospel, young Timothy. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Stay locked in. Resist fear. And fix your eyes and be bold. All right. First, I'm going to go to chapter 3, verse 1. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. Did you, is that, does that resonate with anybody? Just go on social media. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? You ever, you ever just scroll through social media and you're just like, if I see one more close-up of somebody's face, I'm going to throw up. I hate on it. No offense if you take pictures of yourself. I'm not, it's not a jab at anybody. But I've never seen a generation of people so in love with how they look and have to look. It's terrifying. I'm scared of it. I literally, instead of being like, oh, millennials, no, don't do that. If that's where you're at, I've been there before. People only do what they stare at. Do you know that? Whatever you stare at, you're going to post if you do post. Whatever is in you will come out of you in public, whatever's in you in private. Rather than using it, you older ones that are like, ah, if you're bugged by it, let it bug you into intercession. Not judgment and I'm better than them. They're just these lost little kids. Turn the news off. Seriously. And get a, get a prayer life. 
for the next generation. Lovers of money, boasters of proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers of God, traitors, headstrong, haughty lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. Okay, so it starts with the most gnarly sins and then notice what happens. There's, there's A sin is a sin is a sin, but check this out. Haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That I, I think what I think about that, when you think lover of pleasure, whatever I want to do, if I have money, I'm gonna buy it. Or whatever I want to do, if I have time, I'm gonna go do it. I need to I need to fill the funds in my brain so that I don't get to feel what's really going on in me. We all can relate in some way, shape, or form. When I get really mad, you know what I do a lot of times? I clean my house. I put I go to my room and put my clothes away. Is that bad? No. But if I can't settle down and go and dialogue with the Lord, then I'm probably in trouble, right, in that moment. But notice how it says this. I want us to catch this because we need to be aware. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. I want you to know that's not having a form of godliness. I want you to think about what that really means. Paul is warning Timothy and the church Oh, yeah. You'll hear people all the time where they have a church, maybe, or they go to church. God this, God that. And then you see the true colors come out. And you see this person doesn't even know Jesus. Because when I read this and I look at their life and I'm like, and I'm not being judgmental. I, there's nothing in me that's caught to trying to say, hey, I'm trying to stir up some stuff and create rumors about a church. No. But we got to know that this is in our backyard right now. There are churches out there, hopefully not that many, that just, oh, we're going to do this, that, and the other, and have our own form of the gospel. You're going to see it some on TV. Hopefully not all of them. We can't say they're all bad because we know that's not true. But we have to be aware that there is a gospel being preached out there right now that makes us feel good. Why do people leave some churches? And say, I'm done, and then not go back to church. Or typically fear, bitterness, can't trust anybody. But when it, what ends up happening, and you, when you think about this, is there is a sense of a partial gospel being preached and not the full thing. The full thing will cost you your life, which is awesome. Because you were never intended to live for you, you were intended to live for him. The partial truth will keep you bored and keep you busy and keep you involved but yet disconnected. Keep you uh, uh, part of this ministry, that ministry. And I'm not, there's no, if you're trying to think, is he poking at the church? Absolutely not. I love the local pastors around here. I know a lot of them. But I'm telling you, there are churches out there that will burn you out of doing good for them but yet not being connected to what he's saying. And then he, he gives an example. Now, Johannes, and I'm probably saying this wrong, and John Bress <clears throat> resisted Moses. So did so do these also resist the truth? Men of corrupt minds disapprove concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will manifest to all as theirs also was. And I want you to grab a hold of this because this is a picture of what's coming down the pipe for us. This is an end time warning. Of, of days to come. It's already happening, but it, it's going to increase. You can subtly hear it in the background, but guess what? It'll be on volume 12 in a minute. You will, it'll be a normal thing to go out and see the level of persecution. And I feel convicted to talk about it because if we don't address this reality, what ends up happening is we are caught off guard. There will, by the grace of God, be no blindside in this place. I do not want us to be blindsided by something that just kind of, well, you know what? I never saw it coming because we talked about just skill sets of how to be better and how to give more to God. I appreciate that. But when we're sober minded, you won't miss what's around you because when you're sober, you're clear. When you're drunk on the world, it's whatever's in you is coming out of you. 
And I want to encourage us that in this moment, this is, if you look at, I'm not, don't turn there, but just for the sake, <laughs> this is a messengerial invitation to humanity. He's saying resist it and to fully to step into it. I'm going to keep reading. But in verse 10, that you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of love, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, perseverance. So this is the flip side of what I just spoke of. Persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me in Antioch um, at, how do you say that? Iconium and Lystra. At Lystra, which persecutions I endured. And out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So anybody that tells you, ah, oh, you know what, man, just bless the Lord, live a prosperous life. And if people start bothering you and persecution happens, we need to figure out how to change the law. Not really, because it's a promise. Sure, I don't want to go to jail right now, and I don't want to go to jail ever for, for the gospel, but... If it happens, so be it. Why? Because if my boys know one day that I'm in jail because I stood faithful to Jesus, what kind of legacy does that leave them? I bet it's going to put real fire in their bones. Are you following me? That's not something fun to talk about, but guys, it's it's the Bible. This isn't the this is the 101 version right here. This is it. If my boys one day saw that I went to prison because I spoke the word, I hope with all my heart they would look at it. I want to be like him. And if that meant them dying one day in a prison cell because, because they were faithful to Jesus, amen, right? <clears throat> and it says, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. You must continue in things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned from. And from that childhood, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given an inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine and proof and correction for instruction and righteousness. That the men of God may be completely, thoroughly equipped for every good work. We talked about the power in Hebrews, what, what scripture talks and does, and it cuts to the bone. Paul is laying this out to Timothy. Don't miss this, son. And I would say to us this morning, let's let the word of God, again, cut to our heart to actually be a ramp, of an on-ramp, not just a quick, I'm going to get a quick word and run, but to be our daily, literally be our daily bread. That's why he says, give us our daily bread. Why do you think in the wilderness they gave him manna one day at a time? If he kept it, it would spoil him. Because he didn't want, he didn't want stockholders trying to, to mount up on something. He wanted the people of God to know, when I take you to the promised land, it's not going to be the milk and honey that's going to save you. It's my daily bread. And if we don't understand that now, 4,000 some years later, we're in trouble. That the daily bread of God is, be that is better than our future, whatever plan that we have, that everything's going to be all about. Are you following me? This is key. We, if we get a hold of this, we will not be shocked when things start to little friction happens. The kid comes home. They say, man, he yelled at me today. Out, I was talking to a kid about Jesus. Had a, had a teacher flip out about me. That's a good thing. Now, we don't want to go and stick our chest out and try to pick a fight. But we want to be faithful to Jesus. And when people manifest darkness around us, he says that you are actually blessed. Do you want to be blessed? We want to be blessed oftentimes with a, a pay raise or bigger this or bigger that. And in the blessing of God, man, it's so good. And yeah, he is good. But I'd rather have my blessing be because I'm faithful. <clears throat> How many know that it's good to have some enemies? It's good when people don't like you. Not because you told them off and you I got in their face. No, that's not good. But when you've lived a selfless life and you've laid your life down for people and people, people hate you for it, how many of you know that's a good sign? When people start, other, even ministry people, start to talk behind your back, say things that aren't true about you, how many of you know you're doing something right? That's a good indicator that things are going in the right direction. 
not to go try to fix it and vindicate ourselves. The Lord will vindicate us. But I want us to get, I, I feel like I just need to say this for a moment. If everybody loves you, it might not be, I'm going to be careful how I say this, but I'm going to say it. If everybody loves you, you're burning for Jesus and you don't really have any opposition, ask the Holy Spirit about your life. Just see what he says. I'm not saying you're in sin or you're wrong, but if your goal is to just make friends and of everybody and you don't have any resistance, it could be that you're not fully preaching the gospel. Because the promise is that you will be persecuted. Don't go try to get persecuted. So don't like go pick a fight. I'm not saying do that. But I'm just saying be true to yourself. And when someone actually starts to talk some smack about you. Don't do this. You can ask Penny and others. I've had it a little bit here and there. and I'm, It's a good test to see what's in you. Because Jesus makes it really clear. Get excited. You are blessed if they don't like you because of me. Not go vindicate yourself. Write an article of why this ministry or that person's wrong. No, nah, no. Nah. Put a smile on your face and bless the Lord and raise your voice loud. Thank you, Jesus, that you're good. Final point. Preach the word. Chapter 4, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead and his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort, and all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will endure sound doctrine, but, but accordingly to their desires, they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their desires, this is what I've been talking about, because they have itching ears. They will heap up for themselves teachers. Got to find someone that's going to stroke my ego. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. What is a fable? It's a lie. It's not real. Right? They'll turn their ear. They'll make their own doctrine. Up. They'll rewrite the Bible. That's called a cult. You know that. I know it sounds harsh this morning, but I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm just trying to talk to his plane. But you, he says, all right, all that, after hearing all that, but you, be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. I just talked about it. Embrace it. Hug them. Hug your trials. Rejoice, brethren, when you fall into various trials and tribulations for the testing of your faith. So that you can be tried and true and come out on the other side. James 1. He says Get pumped when it comes your way. And that means you're doing something right. God hasn't left you. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. What does an evangelist do? They preach the gospel. Well, I'm not one to be on a stage, Chris. Let your life preach. You go to the grocery store. Let it preach. You see the person that's in help. Let it preach. That needs help. Let it, let it preach. Write them a check. You see whatever. Find a way to make Jesus is named known, not in the name of, of you, but in the name of him. We don't want to just send billions of dollars to a country that needs new food and water and feed a good humanitarian effort with no Jesus. How many of you know we're still sending people to hell? I know it's, I'm just, I'm just talking plain. I'd rather send money with the gospel, bring clean water, build bridges, and release the kingdom of heaven in a territory. Right? Which is what... Essentially what Paul's doing across it as we see this. Final verses. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering and at the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which is the Lord, the righteous judge, who will give to me on that day, not to me only, but to also to all who have loved his appearance. This is incredibly profound. You see, Paul, this is there, it's been said that this was one of his le later year books before he died. <laughs> and he's at the tail end and he's writing to Timothy and he lays out a game plan. And I just briefly touched on it. He lays out a game plan and he says to him, I love this. Stir up the gift of God. Don't be ashamed. Be strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus so that you can stay on fire and resist with fear. Stay locked in. Be an end time messenger, whether it's in your time or in the days ahead. 
understand what's coming to the planet Earth and live it out, and then declare the word. And if you do these things, you'll be saying what I just said to you. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. And guess what? I'm going to a place to get the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me also on that day, not to me only, to all those who love his appearing. How do you love the appearing of the Lord? Is my last question as we go today. Grandma, if you want to come up and just play some keys at me behind. You want to play that nothing else song, if you don't mind? Thank you. You just play that bridge part. And wasn't that good? I won't be more like her. Come on. <clears throat> Paul paints a perfect picture to Timothy. He says, listen, bud, I've done this. Well, Timothy, you can just see Timothy. Well, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm ashamed. I don't know what to do. Imagine Paul. He calls himself the chief among sinners. Killed a bunch of Christians. Timothy, I mean, no, Timothy didn't ever kill anybody. Paul had blood all over his hands for the garbage he did in his life. That dude was a hot mess when he got saved. And he didn't have any shame. Do you know that? There wasn't an ounce of shame on him because he knew the blood made him a brand new person. It wasn't, oh, there's old Solly. Uh, uh, you can hear the voices in his head. You're not Paul, you're Saul. Look at you, you're pathetic. The lies that we listen to, that we feel. How many know Paul felt some stuff but didn't linger in it? You can't help what you hear and feel, but you can't help how you choose to move past it. How many know that he couldn't say God didn't give you just a spirit of fear? Because it was a good thought. He knew it because he walked through it. He knew that transformation laying on of hands. Timothy, stir up yourself and remember, you do not have to be afraid. Because if you choose fear, you're going to crumble. And you're going to go the way of this world. And you're going to choose the immorality and whatever feels right. Hook, line, and sinker and you're done, son. But he said, not you, young Timothy. Because the world is shaking and it's going to continue to shake. And actually in the last days, it's really going to shake. And if you can figure out now how to embrace what I'm telling you, Timothy. You're going to say one day, very clearly, I have fought the good fight. Not, I fought it for a season. It got hard. Some bad things happened. God let me down. It just didn't work out how I wanted it. I, 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 I crucify. Paul, Paul makes that clear. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live. Galatians 2.20. But it's Christ that lives in me. And this life that I live in a physical body now, forever, with him, I live in the flesh. I live by faith now in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's Paul's testimony. He's giving us a picture because it would be cheap of God to not have a reward if we laid our life down for him. That's why Jesus said in John 14, I'm going away, but I'm going to have a huge mansion for you. Like a really big house, but it's going to be awesome. And it's not just going to have like most of the stuff you like. He'll blow our minds when we get to heaven. If it wasn't so, Jesus said, I wouldn't have said it. So take my word. We have to understand that there's, there, is, there, are, there are rewards in heaven that how we do life now will really matter what happens in the, in the next life. I don't know about you, but I don't want to just kind of barely make it in. Just because I prayed a prayer and tried to live a good life and led some songs and preached some sermons and did my duty. You know, oh Lord, I hope I got a big couch up there with a the TV. No. I want it to be said that I want a front seat in front of the throne of God one day. Amen. But I also know that I got to say no to a whole lot of stuff now. That a whole lot of people are going to be very disappointed about and upset with me. And they're going to actually not see me rightly. I'm not talking about you guys. I'm talking about the world. Put yourself in my shoes for a moment because we're all in the same boat. Staying steady for the next X amount of years before he returns, whether you die first or he comes back, is what we're created to do. And I believe 
Paul takes Timothy on this storyline for a real simple purpose to say, son, you're going to get your tail kicked, but it's going to be awesome because you're going to know Christ Jesus. Father, I pray right now. Let it be said of our lives that we were a drink offering poured out. For all the voices that are calling out to us today, and all of the anxiety and the fear and the worry. Oh, I don't feel it. I don't even know if you're real in this area of my life. I've been praying for that prophetic word, holding on to it for years, Lord. I just pray right now that we would put our agendas down, our godly agendas, the ones we thought the way it's supposed to look like. And I pray that we wouldn't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow already has enough worries for itself. Teach us how to sit with you, Jesus. Teach us how to stir up the gift of God on the inside that we would resist fear and have a power of love and a sound mind, soundness of mind over every person in here this morning. I ask that you put a fresh courage within us, Lord, that we would not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, but we would share the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God. I thank you, God, that it's you alone that make us strong in the grace that is in Jesus. I ask that we would actually open up the gift of grace this morning. Some of us that have just said, I'm not worthy. This morning we repent for saying, I'm not worthy. Beloved, you're worthy because the blood of Jesus makes you clean. God draws near because of the blood of Jesus. The fragrance, a beautiful fragrance that covers you and I. We're not part-time sinners that put on the, the, the righteousness of God. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The old is dead, the new is come. And Father, I pray that we would flee from youthful lust. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with all those who call in the name of the Lord out of a pure heart. Awaken us, Lord, this morning. And I pray that you would put spiritual eyes, as, as Paul prayed in Ephesians 1, open the eyes of our understanding to see what's happening around the world, to see the shakings. Put a love in us, Lord, that would be greater than any argument. Put a love in us, Lord, that would be greater than our feelings that we would be a message to those that are unloving and unforgiving, slandering, without self-control, those that hate us, traitors, haughty, lover of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I ask that you would put a love in us that would be so profound for the world. Because it's your desire that none would perish, that all would be saved. I ask that you would give us courage to follow the doctrine, the manner of love, purpose, faith, long-suffering, long love and perseverance, persecutions, afflictions. I thank you that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, that we would manifest Jesus. And Lord, I pray <laughs> for a new resolve to preach the word. We confess our excuses. It's not my thing. It's not my gift. Amen. Praise God. It's not your thing. Praise God. It's not your gift. Thank you, God, that it's the Holy Spirit that's louder. Thank God that Paul didn't come with persuasive words, but he came with a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that you would impart that to us this morning. 
We don't know what to say. We're awkward and uncomfortable unless you're here. It's as simple as that. We're not good on our own. There's nothing in us. Apart from me, you can do no good thing. You told us that. So I pray that the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit would rest on every single one of us, young and old, words of knowledge, the spirit of prophecy, healing, signs, wonders, deliverance. Let it manifest, God, because we're near to you. Because when you're around, everything changes. When you show up, suddenly what we don't understand makes sense. And I pray for the spirit of revelation over all of us in this room to awaken Awaken, awaken, awaken. Let the lies that we can't hear your voice fall off. And I pray for the dream lives to, to come alive. In the middle of the night, would you give dreams that are so clear that those in this room would wake up with understanding, not some confusing dream, but the word of the Lord over our lives and over those around us, over our nation, that you would raise up a five-fold ministry out of this place, God, and across the Treasure Coast. Drink off from the Lord to you, Jesus. Let not one fall away from your hand, including myself in this room and in our community. God, that we would finish the race, whether it's today or 50 years, 100 years from now, whatever it is, Lord, I ask, let us keep the faith that we would stand with a crown of righteousness with you one day. And I pray finally, help us to love your appearing. Put a new longing in our hearts for your return. Put a longing and a desperation for the Lord Jesus to return. That there is a day coming when the spirit and the bride globally will say come. Make your bride ready in this room. A people that would truly know you, truly know you. That at any given moment, when the pressure cooker comes, we manifest Jesus. When the hatred comes, when the accusations come, when the persecution comes, Jesus is manifested. Let us learn from Paul, who was thrown into the prisons, and his, his song was louder than his pain. Let us learn from Paul, when the persecution intensified, he actually prayed for more boldness so more persecution would happen and the word of the Lord would go forth with power. Help us to relearn what being a Christian is, Lord. Help us. Help me. Sing that nothing else. Just wait on the Lord just for a moment.
It's going to show us the little nuggets we can teach our children. Just by modeling it and by being more spirit-led. And I ask God for our marriages that you would reignite fire in marriages in this room. That all the subtle bitterness and frustrations that might, little seeds of discouragement, Lord, would fall to the wayside. And that we would be fueled with intimacy with you, Jesus. Spending time with you. And out of that place, serving our spouses and our children. That this building isn't the Savior to our family, Lord. It's you alone. This is the overflow building where we sit and we give to you. We receive from you. But I thank you that you're the one that draws our children to you. You're the one that draws our marriages to you. So as we go today, Lord, I pray for fresh fire in every family. And even those single in this room. I ask that you would increase the intensity of desire for you. That nothing else will do. In Jesus' name. Amen. We will be here this week. And remember, next Sunday if you come, sit outside and enjoy the white picket fence. We won't be here. So.